off air, it'll say on air. And we're live. Hey, everybody, can you see us okay? We already got somebody. We got Patrick from the Czech Republic. Seriously? Yeah. The uh, we got. That joins us is Patrick from the Czech Republic. I love yep. That. And Gordon from El Paso, Texas. So we got Texas and Czech Republic. Now, you're going to tell me that's only. Oh. There's lots of people. Only Whoops. two of names there. Hold on a second. Okay, there you go. Sorry about that. It's uh, the feedback. Okay, here we go. So basically, everybody's joining up right now. Uh, we got Costa Rica. So I'll, I'll tell Paul. Uh, so can I say Tennessee, just uh, uh, Illinois, New Jersey, Texas. Uh, hi from the UK. Liverpool, Poland, New Jersey. These are all the people that are uh, the uh, you Nashville, Cleveland. You got a guy named New Jersey on me? No, no. <laughs> Kentucky. Montreal, Denmark, Pennsylvania, Quebec, I love Mexico, you. Canada. You saved me three months of traveling. Yeah, Alabama, London. There is Tucson. <laughs> it's not far from me. Colorado. I just Denmark. Yeah, you can see they're all like oh, so Sweden. So uh, we have a good uh, good cross section of the planet. Looks like Montana. All right. So basically, everybody, as you know, we're doing a live stream today with Paul Reed Smith uh, from Paul Reed Smith Guitars. And uh, he's here to answer your guys' questions, uh, pick his brain, uh, learn about guitar and amps. And uh, so and uh, we have already some questions, Paul, for you. People got to send them in and and we got to do a consensus of them so we can start with those. And then as we go, uh, you know, we can answer some on the fly. Um when I did Periscope, they got me. They got me bad. I was reading the questions, and somebody asked me a Kardashian question. It got me good. <laughs> bleach? Never mind. Let's go on. Fair enough. So the first question is, uh, it's a question that goes like this. So there's a lot of artists out there, like, uh, and I'm using a reference. You get a scenario. Ozzy Osbourne once said that he's 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 trying to make his Sgt. Pepper's album that it, he's striving to make this album that he still hasn't made yet. Yeah. And and the ideology behind that is that when you have an artist, whether it's a luthier or, or, a, or, or a musician, there's something that starts the journey, that starts them wanting to do the thing they want to do, and that their, their drive is really that they never feel that they did it. So the question is, what is your, you know, your Moby Dick, your great white well, what is the thing that made you want to build guitars and what is the thing that's driving you every day because you haven't caught it yet? I used to think something was wrong a lot. And we were able to get a couple of changes in and all of a sudden I didn't think anything was wrong. When I'm watching Carlos play live and he's really pleased and it sounds like him or David Grissom and he's really pleased and it sounds like him or John Mayer or whoever it is, I don't think there's anything wrong. Um, what drives me on a regular basis is to make sure that the customers that buy the guitars like the ones hanging behind your head get the same experience as Carlos does. So on Friday um, mornings, all the managers get in a room at nine o'clock and we open cases just like the stores do. And we have the same process and I want to make sure that the guitars are what people signed up for, what we claimed that they were going to be, which was something you could sit down and play in the studio right out of the case or play a gig right out of the case. Or if the there's a fire and the animals and the people are out, you're screaming for the guitar, not for the photographs. So that's what we're trying to do. And so really, I feel very obligated to the customers that save their money for a long time and i feel very very uh attached to the people in this building who've given their lives to it and me trying to support uh that so you know uh, andrew and gene are here in the room and they set this whole thing up and they've been working here for years and i want to make sure that they feel that their time is spent extraordinarily well that uh, at Christmas time, I didn't get a bad uh, review because everybody reviews the boss at Christmas. You know that. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, 
By the way, I never thought it was Sergeant Peppers. I thought it was Revolver. I thought Revolver was their Sergeant Peppers. I thought that was the record. And they always referred to it as, you know, Sergeant Peppers as being the one. That's the one where they changed the band an extraordinary amount. But in terms of just unbelievably gifted songs, Revolver was a big deal. Okay. So did I answer the question? Oh yeah, yeah. I really like I really like what you said, and I've seen you say that in other interviews too about the Friday morning meetings, the eight o'clock meetings. Um, and so my question is, because you've you've kind of talked about that in the past, you know, the, you know, checking everything every Friday. No, it's um, not. We check. We have eight people to check the guitars after it leaves final assembly, but I'm talking about our managers getting in the room and having at it. So. You know, it's very cool. I, look, we're making a promise to the industry. If you get one of these things and you buy it through the internet, you're going to open the case and be able to use it the next second to record a track. That's the that's the goal. You don't have to take it to the repairman afterwards. So, yeah, I, the man, those meetings are very fundamental to us. We're we're not trying to sell a brand. We're trying to make really good instruments for people to play music on. In the end, you prefer to, you know, Paul Reed Smith this and that. But in the end, we're trying to make guitars. It's fair enough. Um, the other question we got was about the S2 line. And the question was, do the S2s use the same fret wire as the core guitars? Same fret wire maker. We use several different heights and widths of wire. The S2s use our standard PRS wire, and uh, Private Stock has two different kinds or three different kinds of wire they use, and Core has two or three different kinds of wire. Whatever the height and width of the wire we think it's appropriate for that model, we do. Um, okay. Oh, we you know, putting really big, tall frets on an acoustic is not usually something that you'd want to do. You, we put medium wire on that. So it's the same maker. We require it to be harder than most other companies because I don't want refrets. Um, uh, I think having a guitar for three years and having to get refretted is pushing it. So. The uh, I agree. I uh, I've done a lot of refrets, and I've your guitars are some of the least amount of guitars I've had to refret. We order the wire harder than everybody else. And yeah. the fret wire guys don't like doing it, but they stick to that they want us as a customer, so they stick to the hardness spec. I mean, look, I've seen wire so soft that you would vibrato the string and the metal would be falling off your finger headed for the floor. That's not a that's that's not good. That was the day I decided let's buy harder stuff. Now I noticed you, you guys, when you're talking about the harder stuff, you said in, in one time you had mentioned that it's one, it's still nickel grade, right? It's not stainless steel, but it's under stainless steel. Uh, hang on, stainless steel and nickel, the stainless steel is full of nickel. So stainless steel and nickel fret wire, the, the composition is not that far different, but go on. Okay, okay. see, that's no, good to know. No German silver and nickel silver. Do you think they put silver in that stuff that's on a guitar? <laughs> People will be taking them off and taking them down to the jewelry store and trading it in. I, this, they don't do that, but whatever. So what's the advantage? You know, because now a lot of makers are putting emphasis on doing stainless steel frets. They're saying- Stainless steel frets are pretty hard. It's pretty hard stuff. It's hard to work with. Um, I think it's good material. I haven't experimented with it enough to be able to give you a definitive answer. I have experimented a lot with what we use. I like what we use. I don't get complaints about it, and the refret return rate is very low. Okay. Of all weird things, Mark Tremonti sent us a guitar back that was, the frets were just annihilated. And it wasn't because the fret wire was soft, it's because he had played it for nonstop 10 hours a day for four years. That was really encouraging that he liked the guitar that much. That's how I. That's how I really found out your fret wire was harder. I had a a customer, he bought an American Standard Strat and he's gigging two nights a week, yeah. four, four hours a night right. uh, doing cover band. And in a year after he bought the guitar brand new, he had just gouged those frets out. 
Yeah. Um, so we refretted it and that was just the process. And then a couple years later, he got a custom 24 and then same process, same instrument. A year later, the frets had basically nowhere in them. Right. So, so. I talked to Jim Daddario about this. It turns out a high E string and a B string are almost the hardness of a file. When you take a piece of wire and you draw it down that small, it gets really hard. So um, the fret wire is nowhere near as hard as the string is. Um, if it was harder than a string, it would eat the string up. But that's not the way it goes. It goes the other way. So it's a balance. I was really surprised when I started to check the hardness of the really small strings, it was really hard stuff. You draw that steel through that small a die, it, 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 it anneals really hard. That would make sense because that's usually where the frets are most chewed up. Is... Yeah, without plain strings. Yeah. 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 So, okay, next question is, um, so this one's a little strange, uh, but it's a little outside the guitar realm. But it's a. Uh, how did you get involved with the radiation research with sound? Uh, there my my father and I worked on all weird things. A uh, guitar synthesizer. The problem with the guitar synth is that when you hit the low E string, it takes three passes of the string back and forth to figure out what frequency it's vibrating at, and then the synth goes off late. Everybody knows that that happens, and we figured out a way to do it much faster. And when we figured that out. We were starting the beginnings of figuring out how to measure a waveform. A string is, you're measuring its frequency, right? So when you're putting ultrasound in the body, you're measuring it when it comes out. When you're putting x-ray in the body, you're measuring it when it comes out. When you're putting radiation in, you're measuring it. When you're putting radar in the air, you're measuring when it comes back sonar. All these machines, a camera is a measuring device for photon waves. That's what it is. And we ran into this without even knowing. We ran into this new technology about how to measure. And we took it to Ted Jensen, the great mastering engineer in New York. He says, I think you've found something digital that's very powerful. You might not want to go in our industry. And I would thought that Ted's, I mean, he's always thought of as brilliant. But I thought that comment was very revealing. And we ended up showing this measuring device to Hopkins. And they liked the idea for lowering the radiation put it when you're doing mammograms and uh, chest x-rays and stuff. Because if we can sh measure it better, we don't have to put as much radiation in the body to do it. So it all started with guitars and ended up not guitars. But you know, I never did make the guitar synth. <laughs> I never made it. We made a guitar synth last year that we were screaming and yelling because it sounded like unbelievable, but that's a whole nother story. One day, we'll see. There's many projects here at PRS we haven't released yet, so maybe that'll be our, uh, what you call it, um, Sergeant Peppers? Right. Yeah, yeah, but right. I don't think so. All right, let's go on. Okay, that ties in the next one, which is, uh, what do you think the next paradigm shift in the guitar technology is going to be? What do you think the next... Where do you think it's going to, not what it is, but where do you think it'll go? All right, there's two answers to that. We'll do the first answer and the second answer, all right? First answer is we're in a throwaway world. What happens when your TV breaks? Now you throw it away. You used to take it to the TV repairman. When your microwave breaks, you throw it away. When your stove breaks, you throw it away. All this, it used to get repaired, right? So for me, I'm fighting with every other thing I have to try and get people to care for their instruments the way a Stradivari violin would be cared for. You think if a Stradivari violin gets a crack in it, you throw it away? No, it goes to the repairman. They're in the shop all the time. You find an extraordinarily good repairman to help take care of your instrument and do all the little teeny things to it that it needs. There was a guy walking by my wife and I in the Atlanta airport with a holding a nylon string guitar and he didn't have a case. And I said, that's the problem right there. She goes, what are you talking about? I said, what's he going to do when it breaks? She said, throw it away. I said, exactly. And every time I'm on the road doing clinics, I'm begging people to look at a musical instrument as a fine thing that needs to be cared for and loved. Okay. And I don't, and so what I, my hope is, which I'm 
half failing at is to convince the world that, you know, it's a musical instrument. We need to care for these things. We need to have instruments that that we are looking after the frets level. We are looking after a refret if, if you played it for 10 hours a day for five years, whatever that is, right? So my hope, which I will probably fail at because prices are dropping and dropping and quality in our industry has dropped a lot, um, is to try to convince people to look at it being something special again. So that would be one. The other thing I can't talk about, uh, we ran into something upstairs that m might be a way of getting away from 50s technology. So, so right now, what do you, you got a guitar that's not that much different than what Ted McCarty and Leo Fender made in the 50s. You've got single coil pickups were wire mag wound on Alnico magnets, and you've got humbucking pickups with and from 1958 with two coils and an Alnico magnet underneath and millions of variations in that and variations on the scale links and all that stuff. Probably the fundamental biggest thing that ever happened in our industry was a, when, you, when they invented the precision bass, you didn't need to put an upright bass in the cab anymore to go to another session. You can just grab the case and go. It was a big deal. Um, so do I see that coming? Um, not to that level, but I, there's a couple of things that could be very cool. Um, we make electric guitars, um, and uh, they're not that electric. They're a passive device, actually. And the bass industry has gotten closer to accepting preamps, and um, what pedal board is is 20 preamps. That's what it is. We've turned the guitar into a synthesizer controller, really. All the pedals are you know, a way to modify the sound. Um, but I see something coming and you're not going to get me to talk about it. No way. I think it's <laughs> patentable. I'm not talking about it. Next question. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, this one's just an easy one. Uh, we had a viewer ask about the, uh, so you started, when you started your guitars, yellow was the primary color, right? The yellow one was one yeah, of the ones the, you used a lot. It was yellow, blue, and red. And so... poster. First brochure, yellow, yellow, blue, and red. And their question was, on the 594, how come there isn't a red one? Uh, you don't make a red one. You so can that's order a red one in private stock right now. I'll make whatever you want. I'll even put a cigarette lighter in it. I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> I mean, come on, give me a break. You can get a red guitar. There's a guitar behind you close to red. The back of the other one, the PRS is red on the back. Of course I'll make red. The yellow thing... Guitars in general, the middle of an old Strat, the middle of an old Les Paul, a gold top, they're all versions of yellow. Violins are all versions of brown, orange, and red and yellow, right? I mean, this is not new that guitars are yellow. I mean, a Martin, when it, when it, when the top ages, it turns yellow. Uh, right. That's, that's just, just, yellow is the guitar color. What blew me away and what started it all was somebody sent me a purple balloon. He said, blow it up, hold it to the light, and make it that color. So we blew up this balloon, held it up to light, and it was a spectacular purple color. And that's when we stained them purple. The brown guitars came because there was brown stain in the wood and we wanted to cover up. The black ones came because it was black stain in the wood we wanted to cover up. The green one that's sitting over behind you came because it was green stain in the wood that we wanted to cover up. And so we didn't want to throw the wood away. So that all started. And then we hired these guys from MICA, which is the art school here in Maryland, and they went nuts with the colors. And so now we have a six month running start for a new color and a, a company that I can't mention actually didn't just copy the color, they took the name too, which I thought was really ballsy. And we used to have a year head start or two years head start on tortoise shell. That's over. These guys are inventing new glow colors and stuff by the day. And what fun. It's just, look, it's a big spectrum of colors and we're like staining things sideways and staining them this way and that way. Just people like having something that nobody else has. I it's agree. Okay. It's all right. Get over it. Eh, we'll stain it any color you want. We just made a double neck for a very famous guy. He's going to be on the road with it. It's blue. So this sky blue color. Hell, I'll tell you, it's for John McLaughlin. He's going out with Jimmy Herring. What fun. So it's a double neck 12 string, six string guitar? 
Well, that's kind of what John played in the old days, didn't it? Yeah. 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 Okay, that, that ties us in since you mentioned art, an artist. This is the another thing that came up in a question. What's your shirt? A guy plus a guitar equals a happy guy with yeah. his fingers up? What is that? Yes. Okay, fair enough. I don't do this. Next. <laughs> the, uh, we we actually have, it was funny, we actually have a version of this shirt with a double cut looking guitar instead of a Strat looking guitar. And the guy's doing the hang 10 instead of the rock yeah. sign. Is that good or bad? Uh, I, just just because not everybody likes the whole rock thing. you know. Whatever. All right, next. So, so the question came up about artists and something that, you know, on this channel, we're a lot of gear geeks. And we noticed something about your artist roster that is very impressive, but understated. So on your artist roster, what we, what, when you look at your artist roster on your page, there are dozens and dozens of guitar players that are not so much famous, but known for backing famous people. Mm -hmm. You have Beyonce's guitar player. Uh, you have, uh, you know, Dave, Dave Wiener, you have Steve Vai's guitar player. Yeah. You have, you know, Tim McGraw's guitar player, Toby Key's guitar player, uh, Keith Urban, Grand Funk Railroad, um, Reba McIntyre, Jess Tall, you know, right? Carrie Underwood. What's uh, wrong with that? You're no, 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 no. This is the important part. It's not Jennifer Lopez, you know, it just goes on and on. The important, it's not nothing wrong with it. It's something right with it. That is impressive. It's almost a statement that says, if you're a musician that has to literally impress the hardest boss in the industry, you know, everybody from Elton John to Bruno Mars to, you know, to Beyonce, it matters that your gear is right. It's not like you're, you're getting an endorsement. You're, you're literally need this stuff to be right. If you're the guitar player for Garth Brooks, you don't get a why second did, chance on stage. Why don't you stage. run my marketing department with, with, uh, with Judy? That comment is extraordinary. Nobody's ever said that. Normally, we'll get shot. How come it's not Toby Keith? How come it's his guitar player? But you're right. And I, I couldn't really appreciate what you just said more than what if it's wonderful what you just said. Everybody here would be cheering to hear what you said. Um, and, I, you know, uh, Bev has worked with her team unbelievably hard in artist relations to do that. I'll tell you a story about that that blew me away. I was at a dinner for all these artists in the country market in Nashville. And they got with me and they said, we have to take a PRS to the session now. And I looked at them, I said, what? And they went, yeah, if we don't, they'll erase our tracks. And I went, pardon me? They said, look, they're tuning every syllable of the vocals. And if it's not in tune with the vocals at the end of the track, they're going to erase me. And the PRS is in tune and the vintage guitars aren't. And I was like, oh, my God, we put the nut and the frets in the right place. I never thought of it as a fundamental import. He says, we don't want our tracks erased. And they're tuning all the vocals on these tracks. I was like, wow. And then if you back up to the other comment, I'm sorry, the guy that played with Elvis played a telly. I mean, this has been going on forever, what you're talking about. This is not new. Right. So that sold a lot of tellies. Yes. So, you know, uh, it was James Burton, right? So um, I think what you're saying is wonderful. We're, I'm, che I'm cheering for my whole company for what you just said. Because those guys have made us viable. I, I agree. I, I, uh, I, totally, I, I totally agree. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, awesome what you just said. By the way, me saying you should be doing this with Judy, I'm almost I'm just saying that as encouragement to, to the way you put it. Believe me, we believe that in our bones, but it's not for us to say, it's for you to say. If we say something like that, it's not appropriate. But when you say it, I can cheer. Yes. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm 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 glad. Because like I said, I think I thought, like I said, that's why we I took the list. Um, it's, uh, it is a unique thing to see. And actually, you know how I noticed it was at the NAMM show in Nashville. I was, I got my first time going to Nashville, uh, a couple months ago. And when I was checking out players around town, I was noticing what they were using. You know, you're looking for, this is, that's a, that's definitely a, you know, a, a player's town, right? And Big time. It, yeah. And so, you know, you start noticing some trends and what they have. And, yeah. you know, and the expected trend was strats and tellies. You know, you're like, that's what you're going to see. 
and some Fender amps. And what you started noticing was exactly what you said. I noticed a lot of Paul Reed Smiths. Yeah. Um, and funny enough, when asking them, intonation was probably the biggest thing given. They, but also sound. Yeah. And that, and that brings us to the next question, which is, you know, everybody knows that Paul Reed Smith has quality. That 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 you can see and touch. You don't have to be told that. You don't have to be told what quality is. You can you can, you know, touch it. Mm -hmm. But the Paul Reed Smith sound, you, you know, the guitar sound, that's the question. The question is, this is a hard one. So Harley Davidson actually uh, patented the sound potato, potato, potato. <laughs> right? Go, go, um, go, 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 go. Yeah. I mean, the overcammed motor. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm sorry. That's in a linger fountain. When you have a, when one of these uh, linger felt or engines and they put, they overcam it, my bet used to go. Is that what you, they, they actually patented the sound potato? Yes. Potato, yeah, yes. Right. And my mother wears cowboy boots to bed. Keep going. <laughs> so the question is, what, what is the Paul Reed Smith sound? All right. So I, look, you know, something's changing fast. When it started, a Marshall 50 didn't have enough gain and people didn't have gain pedals. So you had to make the guitar loud enough to drive the amp so that it had some some gain, right? And that's when we started with the HFS thing. And things have slowly moved and moved and moved and moved. And it's getting clearer and clearer and clearer. I was in Japan in 1988. And there was a large group of um, uh, press there. And they said, what's the Paul Reed Smith sound? Tell us. Now in America, if the guy, if the American doesn't say anything for 20 seconds, they well, let me rephrase the question. Right, 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 right. But not in Japan. They sat there and they looked at me and they weren't going to say a word till I answered the question. I'd never been asked, and I, I mean, my brain was screaming trying to figure out an answer, and I finally said clear and powerful, and they liked that answer, and I want it to sound full and have a clarity to it. Is it a Strat in-between sound kind of very particular uh, one sound kind of thing that you know that when Dire Straits is playing, that's a, that's a Strat? No, it's not that kind of thing. It's much more of a versatile tool to do a job. And one of the things that Bosco France said the other day at a clinic, he said, whoever picks up a PRS, they sound like themselves. They don't sound like that guitar. They sound like themselves. And that's what the idea was. You want David Grissom to sound like himself. You want um, uh, uh, Jimmy Herring to, to play, sound like himself. By the way, Jimmy Herring's playing state-of-the-art guitar right now, if anybody's seen Widespread Panic or his band. And I said, why in God's name, Jimmy, are you playing a pure He said, because it'll do things my vintage guitars won't do, which I thought was a very sophisticated answer. I asked it one asked Brent Mason, why was he playing a DGT? And he goes, because it works for me, which I thought was a very sophisticated answer. In other words, when I plug it in with my style in, in an amplifier, it works for what, I, what it is that I want to do. So my hope would be that the guitar would sound like the person who's playing it, not like the guitar. That's awesome. Much better than potato, potato, potato. I like potato, potato, potato. <laughs> Anything that's an identification is good. I just can't believe they got away with it. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> next. Okay, the next one is, uh, so here's a question, and it's about the SEs and uh, Rosewood in the idea that there's some, some viewers out there were saying that they live in areas of the world now where there's not a Paul Reed Smith dealer, so they order online, but they're yeah. having trouble getting SEs because of the Rosewood issues. So their question is, are you going to look at making some SEs now? Are you going to look at alternative fretboard materials for the SEs All right, so that's to make the that easier? That's the first time I've heard of that. We play the game the way the game's played. And right now, with the Rosewood, they want an import document and an export document. We're not having trouble in exporting the guitars because we get the documents from the government. They came, they went to the distributors with the documents. So I don't know, that's the first time I've heard that. Um, every single SE we ship out of here, every guitar we ship overseas from our S2 and CE and Coreline all have the documents for Rosewood. Um, it takes 45 days from the day we ship it for it to land now because the government has to give it a piece of paperwork. 
but that's the first time I've heard of it. I will look into it. There's going to be some meetings in DC coming up. We were the first people in the movie line. In other words, when it came time to do the import documents and the export documents for guitars, we were the first piece of people in line at the government office going, we're first, um, we want to make sure we do this right, tell us exactly what to do. They told us exactly what we did, and we did it to the letter. We were the most, oh, as fast, um, literally they said, you're the first company to come in. And all the people behind the curtain that we'd never met at Fish and Wildlife were sitting in my office the week after this announcement. The U.S. government didn't do this. The U.S. government had to abide by the ruling. Right. So I don't know. That's new information for me. I need to look into it. Um, if that person who said that can write me a letter through customer service and describe exactly what the situation was, I'd like to know. Yeah, there, that's there, good information to have. I didn't know that. Look, they don't. They're not trying to shut the Rosewood use down. They're just trying to make sure that people don't violate the law. It all started with the Chinese using the uh, Rosewood from Vietnam, which we don't even use. Dalbergia conscientious is what it's called. I uh, can't pronounce the word correctly, and we don't even use the stuff. So. Uh, it's a long, interesting game that's going on. And then that brings us to the next question, which is, you guys did those reclaimed wood guitars this year, which were a hit. I mean, they sold out like nothing. You know um, why, right? Did you strum one? Oh, they're fantastic. They rang like bells. It was yeah. like easy to sell. It's like they just went away. They had nail holes in them and people couldn't get them fast enough. But... But you stated out there you were you were talking about them and you made a comment that because they are, the wood came from from Africa is that where yeah, it came South from America. S South America, you had made a statement that it was a little difficult to try to get barns you know the reclaimed wood here in the United States. So is there something that hinders you from getting reclaiming wood here? No, not as much. But this stuff was available down there. It looked like good musical instrument wood. It wasn't. Um, a conifer like most of the reclaimed wood is on barns in this country. I mean, you don't find walnut barns. They didn't cut, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I think it surprised us. I think it has surprised the industry. I think it surprised the customers at how fast these things got ordered. As a matter of fact, more got ordered than we had wood for. Yeah. And, um, very interesting how, look, in the Friday morning meetings, we'd strum them and go, nice guitar. We were hardly putting any paint on them. You know, they had this satin nitro on them and ah, it's just good fun. Look, to everybody that bought one, to all your gear people who are enjoying one, thank you. And let's just leave it at that. Fair enough. Um, the next one is... Uh, so, uh, the, the, what have you learned? So now you guys have been doing the S2 line for about three years. Yeah. What have you learned from doing that? From Because you've now separated your American line into two categories. So, you know, and, and, and on a side note, I want to add to that question, which is because I have S2s as well. I love the S2s. Um, and it's interesting to me because there are some things about them to me that are exactly like the core guitars and there's some things that that are not like the core guitars but i still love them so it's so it's not like they're less that's what i want to get at they're not lesser right, so, than they're just different what did i learn was your first question yeah hundreds of things so that's an unfair question you're talking about starting up a new line and cutting the price by three-fifths and still making it in maryland if you don't think there's a learning curve on how to buy the parts, how to make them in that kind of time, what the how to do the neck uh, process different and still have the neck be straight for a lifetime and all the body stuff and ordering the pickups and the bridges and it just goes on and on and on. I've learned a huge amount. To be specific about it, you'd almost have to go part by part, whether it be the nuts or the tuning pegs or the fingerboards or the frets or whatever. So I, let's leave that one for B. When we built this building, we built it on the day the, we moved in almost to the day the economy took a dump, the day that the mortgage crisis hit. And we had built it to build that guitar. 
but now we were in uh, uh, survival mode and we built our wood libraries and everything we could possibly do. We put all the wood up for sale that we'd been hoarding away for 10 years. We did every trick in the book to stay alive. The boat business in Annapolis died by 90% in one day. And my friend owned Chris Craft of the Chesapeake, uh, Chris Craft of the Chesapeake, he was, he was bankrupt in three months. So we, we worked really, really hard. Three years ago, things had recovered enough for us to work and spend the money on the tooling that we built this original building for. And the idea was always to make a Maryland built guitar for two-fifths of money. And it worked. Um, it worked different than we thought. People took a huge amount of them, then it kind of relaxed, and now it's coming back up. I think it has a good reputation. I think it's um, considered a quality guitar built in Maryland. Um, but, you know, the pr prices of things, if you haven't noticed, whether it's DW drums or whatever, prices have dropped. And for people to survive under the situations, um, it's not so easy. I think S2 is a real success at two-fifths of money, and the new Sons Era amp that we're doing is a real success, and the new acoustics that we're doing in SE is a real success. Um, we have really focused on how do you make a guitar that plays in tune, stays in tune, and gets great sounds, and plays well, and da-da-da-da-da for less money. It's not so easy to do. Um, if I was a consultant and I didn't have PRS guitars anymore, the amount that we learned from S2 is enough for me to make a living on. So that's an unfair question. You'd have to be very specific about what did you learn exactly so, about what. Well, okay. So on that note, um, the S2s, like things that I, 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 I don't notice. Does it make sense? So on the core guitars, you use a quarter sawn, basically a one-piece neck. Yeah. But on the S2s, you know, you... you it's you, a scarf you, back joint. Yeah, good luck finding it. It's, so, it's glued oh, so you, well, you'll you, never even you, find it. You, you can't. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, what's wrong with that? No, there's nothing wrong with it. That's my. That's where I'm going with this question. To me, having both the guitars and loving them both equally. All right, so let's go there. I don't notice a whole lot of difference. Scarf neck joints were a sign of a cheaper guitar. But the but we are ho our hope was if we did it well enough, it wouldn't be the sign of a cheaper guitar anymore. Right? So... Um, if you scarf on a big long heel on a Martin guitar, it's not a sign of a big guitar, right? I mean, it, it's okay. And especially with the, with the way wood prices are going and all that stuff, if you can make one hell of a guitar with a scarf headstock, who cares, right? And as a matter of fact, in some ways it's stronger. I made my living gluing Les Paul headstocks on because the case fell over when I was young. And this thing ain't going to break because now the grain's going with the headstock. It's not at an angle. So what did we learn? I mean... We've retooled it a couple of times to make sure it's better and better and better and better. What have I learned? It's okay. We actually made a curly maple one and I couldn't see the neck joint. I couldn't see the scarf. So it's the times they are changing. It's okay. Well, they're, they're fantastic. Um, so the other last, uh, last question about the S2s. So on the S2 line, all of the necks are, wide fats basically right pattern no, we make wide thins on c's oh okay well on the c's but that's um, got an s2 neck on it i mean it's not called an s2 but it's got a scarfed headstock on it right so on the but, same line but on the se models the korean models i meant the ce I, yes I yes on the ce yeah yeah but on the se models the korean yeah. models you do the SC245 with the thicker neck, but you do the yeah. Custom 24, the thinner neck. Yeah. So what was, which I think makes sense, right? The play, I think that aligns itself correctly with the players. The right. the players want a Custom 24, generally want that faster neck. Players with the more yeah. girth in the body, thicker neck. So why not the S2s follow that same logic? Give the Custom 24 S2s that smaller neck and then the, the other body we're shapes. We're not getting complaints. In S2, yeah. we don't offer the wide thin, the, the pattern regular, the pattern neck, and the and the and the and the the thin one, the regular, and the fatter one. Because if you don't cut the amount of skews down, the amount of models that you make, you can't make it for that price. Every time you have another option, it makes it more harder to make. Every time, but nobody's complaining. 
I don't, he, I have not got one phone call that, you know, I'll take an S2 if you can just put a regular neck on it. I don't hear it. I hear, ah, oh, nice neck, same carve as the other one. I don't hear it. I, if I heard it, I'd be squawking if sales were down because people were saying, if you only did this, look, let me give you an example. Remember the hollow bodies? Remember the piezos? Right. Well, we like the, that, but if you could only do the piezo in a 22 fret hot, solid body, well, well, let's do that. No, 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 no. If you could only do it in a 24 fret solid body, oh, we do that now. No, no, no. I got to have it on the tremolo. If you could only do it on the tremolo, then we'd buy it. I mean, we hear this all the time. If you only, only, then maybe I would buy it. I'm not hearing it on S2. People are happy with the choice that we made on the next shape. If you want one after this interview, reaching these many people in this much of the world, I'll go hand carve the thing for you. I'll do whatever you want after what you're doing. Are you kidding? How many people are, are on? Do you have a number? In yeah, right now we have 640 yeah, people right. watching live right now. I have a clinic with over 150 people. I've done good. You, 650 worldwide, go kiss yourself. Good job. Thank you. The, uh, um, and then uh, and then we'll do one last question, and then we'll take a couple quick live ones, and then we'll we'll let you go. Uh, so the uh, this one I'm gonna get killed if I don't ask. Uh, so, but I know it's probably not a question you you like. Well, look, I'll do this whenever you want, however often you want. I think that what you're doing is tremendous, and I'm you, know, you, you set it back up with me or Andrew or anybody else. I'll do this. This is great. I'm yours. Thank you. I'll, so, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be the new co-host. Let's go. <laughs> so the so the question I got from the left. I was ask you that question. I can hear it I'm going. <laughs> the, the question I got from the lefty players was, how come no lefty SE? They understand. In fact, the email was really interesting. They said, we understand what Paul has said in the past about retooling time in the factory, the American factory, all this stuff. But why is it that, this is the question, how come a store can order 50 special SEs and do a special run and they advertise it all the time, all kinds of stores like Axe Palace and stuff. But no stores are offering a 50 limited run of left. So there's no lefty affordable price here at the car. I don't know. Well, first of all, we're having some problem with the transmission. But I don't know. Let's just say we're planning on releasing the lefty SC next month. I can't tell you. I can't tell you. You don't know what we have planned. And I'm right. not going to tell you. Because if I tell you, I told everybody before the, I told my reps and my distributors, so eh, I'm going to be in Dolphin. Eh, I'm not going to tell you. So you don't know what I have planned. Uh, it's a good question. I'll relate it to Jack Higginbotham, who's in charge of this whole thing at this point. I'll tell him there's a great interest in lefties. Forget it. Go to the next question. All right. By the way, they don't make left-handed pianos. They <laughs> The, it was funny over here. Never mind. <laughs> you know, uh, on a side note, Any you know, the saxophones, Gene. No. Next. Uh, um, Hendrix so, played a right-handed guitar, left-handed. This is didn't hurt him, did it? I no, but I think that's what's. I think that's what By makes way, it harder for lefties. From the people who knew him, that he could play with the strings on the bottom or the top, either way. Really. Yeah, yeah. It's nice to be a genius. Go on. Um, that's interesting. I never heard that. Yeah. But uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, Did you hear what he says? They said, "How's it feel to be the best guitar player in the world?" He says, "I don't know. Go ask Rory Gallagher." Yeah, and you go watch Rory Rory Gallagher play at that time. It, he was playing state of the art guitar. There's a video out there on YouTube where they interview all these guitar players yeah. and they ask them who's the best. And what they did that's amazing is they ask Clapton, they go, who's the best guitar player? And he says like Hendrix. And then they just show an interview with Hendrix saying Roy Gallagher. And then they ask Roy Gallagher and he says, it's like, you know, Billy Gibbons. And then they ask Billy Gibbons and it's funny, they chase the line. Yeah, they chase uh, the line. So they asked <laughs> Hendrix, so, so, well, he said, be worried about a guy in Texas. He brought Billy Gibbons up, but didn't bring his name up, right? <laughs> I mean, I just, there's some people playing state-of-the-art guitar right now. I mean, just state-of-the-art guitar. There's some really... I mean, you go see Jimmy Herring play or John Mayer right now, and they and they start the solo, and they take you on a journey. 
they take you on a journey like the old days. I mean, there's some really good guitar players playing right now. Really good. It's, w- it's a wonderful time to be in the industry. I went and saw uh, John Mayer on August 2nd. And it's the first time I'd seen him play since he had the nodes, you know, and he was fantastic. It was one of the best shows I've ever seen. Hmm. Um, and uh, the amp Carlos, sounded Carlos fantastic. Carlos Santana and, and Mark Tremonti, you know, all these guys I've mentioned are playing really well. Let's go on. I'm having fun. Fair enough. Preaching to the choir. The, uh, um, okay, the question about the Sunzera amps is... Uh, any, the, the, the Sanzera Sanzer amps are obviously amazing. I yeah. think they've definitely done well. You guys are selling them like crazy. Everybody's received them well. Um, I think they're they as good as. Amp ship month ever in the history of our company this month. Yeah. I, I think. Sanzera it, for the money, you just can't beat it. I used a Sanzera 50 combo at the vintage guitar show and there were 412 and 100 watt amps all the way across the stage. Nobody said. I hit one chord and sent it to Texas. It was stupid. The uh, the bass um, coming out of that little amp's not fair. I, I agree. I, I the twenty watt I loved. It had it, it just had so much presence and fullness in it, yeah. which you don't see. Um, so the question was: uh, n- now that you've seen that they're you know you've you've success with them, are you going to offer a cabinet for them? Because one of the problems, of course, is you can buy the head, but you no can't buy a cabinet. Idea what we're going to release next week? I can't. <laughs> it's a. It, you're not the first. Under, we're under request the cabinet. It's a constant request. I've heard it at the meetings. I can't tell you what we've got planned. Duly noted. Thank you very much. Maybe you can send me a letter once a month about all the things your people say that if you had one, I'd buy one. I'm not talking about the punter that sits there and does keyboard courage and attacks everybody. I'm talking about somebody who actually wants to buy something. The, uh, and then, and then, so this one's another good question too, because obviously, you know, the 594 is very successful. I have one. I got one. I ordered one from you at the NAMM show and I got it about a month ago. Okay? So uh, I love it. It's amazing. Okay. Um, and that, that's definitely, your your guitar going after that that kind of less Paul market, right? Um, in the idea I, that I, you, right. So <laughs> so of course you know. Uh, so how how long before you have like a, a Strat type guitar? Then you know what I mean. I mean I know there's the prototypes out there from what John Mayer. Are you Mayer. trying to do? Are you trying well, to get no? Well, Paul, why don't you just give me a list of all the stuff you're going to release in the next six months so I can tell all my people, and I'll tell you exactly what the price points and all the specs are before you ever release it. I mean, <laughs> he's asking about a Strat-type guitar or a Les Paul-type guitar or whatever. Fair. No, I, no, no. I Look, there's been a lot of stuff on the Internet of some of our artists showing sneak peeks of what's coming. You didn't get it from me. Here's the problem with single coil guitars. If you don't have the signal to noise ratio high enough, the hum can be louder than the guitar. The guitar actually has to be really loud and the pickup has to be really loud. Otherwise, the noise is louder than the guitar. And you, you, some, you know, if, if you, one of the reasons these guys play old 63 and 64 strats is because the signal noise ratio on that's better than on a 54. Um, so those are the years where the pickups were the loudest and where the signal noise ratio was the best. You think these guys want the hum louder than the guitar? They don't. It's not an easy game to play doing single coil pickups. Um, anybody who's played a P90 in a noisy club knows you got a banshee going off in the amp, right? So, and you got people like Rob, Robin Ford who play right on the edge of distortion where it's okay, right? But if you got a guy playing high gain, some of those single coil pickups making so much noise, you need a gate. Not an easy game to play. And if we go into that market, I don't want it to be a me too. I want it to be like, wow, this works. Look, we're guitar makers. We want to make a guitar that's not just a look or a sound or an imitation of something they saw on a towel, you know, some rock star playing it. We want to make them a guitar that you can't rip out of their 
their hands. If you're sitting on a couch with a, with a guitar you love, you're in no pain, and when you put it away, there's no hangover. Therefore, it's the best drug ever made. Guitars, are, it's the violin of our time. It's a good thing. I, I don't want to go into the single core market unless we've really done something with a lot of time and energy trying to figure out the best pieces of history and what we can make better and da da da. It's not such an easy game. It's not so easy. Otherwise, uh, otherwise everybody be in Fender's pocket. I I I really liked what you did when you did the three hundred five. That was not really a true single coil, but kind of like the stacked single coils. Those were fantastic. That wasn't. That was Alnico square rectangular magnets. Uh, a DC three was the one. The guy in my band still plays a DC three. I used, when I did machine gun. Um, with the PRS band, and we recorded and got that tone that you can find. That was with a DC-3. They hum. That's a single coil pickup. But the signal noise ratio on a DC-3 is pretty good. Um, I like DC-3s. We got guitar of the year from the entire press for the NF-3, and then you guys didn't buy them. Now you can't find them on the internet. So go figure. Some things happen in a week, and some things don't take 10 years. Stratocasters were out of business until... Uh, Hendrix and Clapton picked one back up. I mean, you know, and Stu Ray Vaughan and Hendrix are selling so many Stratocasters from the grave, it's out of control. Yes. You never know. You just never know. The story is going to be different. Ah. The, well, the DC-3, you didn't have a player on it. That's the That was the problem when it came out. I'm not so sure that's true, but uh, it, we didn't have a uh eric clapton level player on it that's true yeah but the guys I, that have them won't sell them oh i i yeah i absolutely agree you got one i'll buy it <laughs> next <laughs> <laughs> um Actually, the reason i say that is howard Luft least took my dc3 to play in Las. he's doing that big rock show in las vegas and he needed a single coil guitar and the only one i had was mine and he got the one i'd used on machine gun so whatever Guys, we got five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, let's see if we can take a, a just a raw question. Let's see what we can got. Can I tell you something? Sure. We're doing a version of this at PRS. Do you know that we've started our little YouTube channel where, like, we do an Instagram live? Yes. Yeah. So this thing that you're doing, which I which I've offered to be a part of, we're starting to do too. It it the fact that we're going to be able to do a TV show streamed from our factory with very little investment and no deal with you know the tv stations is awesome and by the way it's amazing a huge number of people watched the last one what fun i mean the first time i did periscope my jaw dropped it what is happened? it is because it, this is my thought for yeah. whatever it's worth i think the reason why this stuff works now is i like this term if you use the term social media which mm -hmm. is what this is then that would mean that the existing source of media is unsocial media. In other words, this is a two-way street and that was a one-way street. That was TV and radio was somebody telling you something, but you had no influence on what was being told to you. Social media is even now, we could read a question, but more importantly, the comments that they leave in these videos, you read them. Whether you say you do or you don't, it changes who you are as a person and they've infected change on you and vice versa. So the new world where people can tell how they're interacting has made this exciting. Okay, point taken. I heard everything you said. Fair enough. Uh, you changed, switched my view slightly, but go on. That's good. <laughs> this is um, interactive, interactive TV. Interactive TV. That's exactly it. Fair enough. So here's the question we'll, we'll end with. Since it's a live question, it was a good one. The it's no. What's the next question? <laughs> The, the question was, do you, at this point, do you actively look for new artists to, to reach out to um, or do they just pretty much come to you now? Um, and both. Fair enough. Really? Really? We're only going to play one side of the coin? Really? No, that's now. Look. Real rock stars don't come available very often. They don't come up. But, you know. Uh, you, we've listed people here that 
are not PRS endorsers that are using PRSs in the studio all the time. Um, uh, there's a lot going on. We're very active in talking to people and we're, they're very active in contacting us. It's really hard to deal with because of the quantity of communication going on. Um, uh, the thing that happened with John Mayer was very cool because he needed an instrument to do that Dead & Company tour that got that sound. And I didn't understand the depth of what it was that that Jerry Garcia tone came from. It's not just the middle pickup, which is, by the way, where it comes from. But they're, they're playing a bop. They're playing a like, kind of hillbilly bop swing music, right? which is a, a form of jazz, but available to the masses. It's a different kind of thing with vocals. I, I got schooled in what that all was about. And to get the nod to make that instrument was extraordinary. I mean, John went through every pickup we made in every position with every scaling. He went through everything to make sure that he could get that tone. At one point, we sent him a whole bunch of wooden beads and he filled the whole cavity of the F-hole with wooden beads to hear what it would sound like without the cavity. He goes, ah, all the magic's gone. He shook them out and that was the end of that. I mean, we did everything we could do, scalings wise, pickup wise, wiring wise. It didn't work without a phase switches. It did work with coil cancel switches. He wanted that preamp that Josh Florian made. Um, I mean, wow, what an interesting thing. And we sold a hundred of them in about 24 hours. And then we sold another 120 of them in about 24 hours. And uh, it was fascinating to get the nod to get that Jerry Garcia tone. Um, who knows? He came after us, but we knew, you know, we knew it was a possibility. Uh, Mark Holcomb coming here was wonderful. Uh, Dusty Waring, uh, I can, Mark Tremonti calling, uh, you know, us going after I mean, I went to Carlos Santana, that's how it started. I said, hey, you know, I showed the truck driver and then the truck driver introduced me to the tech and then the tech introduced me to Carlos, you know, it's long story. I went after Al Di Miola. I went after Howard Lisa, you know. It's all and more. Artist relations is about us trying to get the customer happy. We don't fight that battle with money. We fight that battle with guitars. We are trying to get them the best instrument they can possibly have. If there's 10 guitars in the boat, our job is to make that guitar the one they want to go for when the lights go down. That's our job. It's fun. I actually enjoy that part. Will you thank all your people for being a part of this? That was really I, cool. I, that was fun. That was just good fun. Good questions. Yeah, I want to definitely thank everyone for the questions. That was really nice of them. They, 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 we actually, what we did was they sent in hundreds of questions and we sorted them and then merged them into group so what's questions. what's the one you didn't want to ask me? What's the one we, question that you were like horrified to, to ask Paul? I want the worst question. Give me the one that you would never ask. Go for the throat. Be a Doberman for a minute. So, okay. So there was, there was a merge of these questions right here that were, uh, one was, and it merged into a, another question. So I'll give it to you. It was, uh, what is your relationship with Nick Huber? Uh, like, and it's extraordinary. He's one of my students. That's easy. And I, and I help teach him make guitars. I come on, go for something hard. Well, that ties a question like why are PRS guitars, sissy guitars? Why don't you ask something about how easy they play and why I get crucified for it? Or, you know, why don't you come up with something new than a 25 inch scale? Why don't, why don't you go for something like deep? Well, Hoover's easy. He was my student. He's fun. He's a good guy. So, so here, here's, here's where it tied into. This is where the question led to. So you had mentioned, you had mentioned that you had found a mentor, like your Ted talks, find yeah. a mentor. Okay. Yeah. So you, yeah. you went and found Ted McCartney. Yeah. I so was intention. I and wasn't in trying to find a mentor. I was trying to find somebody to tell me about how those guitars were made. But in your statement in that Ted talk, you said you, you gave the tips on how to find a mentor yeah. and why you should find one. Yeah, of course. And you even said that a mentor, you basically alluded that a mentor at a certain age becomes a mentor. Before that age, they don't want to teach you. They're still out there yeah. doing it. Anybody so over the 50 doesn't want to die with all that So the question is, 
are you a mentor now or are you still doing it and you're not ready to be a mentor yet? That was the hard question. Yeah, that was really hard because you just got me. I, there are a lot of children I talk to. There are a lot of uh, people in the industry I talk to. I was talking uh, to one of our new employees, Chris Magliocla today. There's teaching going on all over the place in terms of them teaching me about what they're learning, you teaching me right now. I want it to be a two-way street. I can't stand using interns. If I have an intern, I want him to get as much from the relationship from me as I got from them. I, this whole thing of using people, I don't, I'm not into it all. Most of the real mentoring I'm doing is with young people um, right now with my sister's kids and my kids and... Uh, one of the things my son asked me when my grandson was born was he said, will you teach my son what you know? And I took about 45 seconds to answer because if I say yes to the first one, I said yes to the last one. It's all of them. You don't just pick and choose kids. That's not okay, right? So I said yes, and then I went to his wife and I said, you're pregnant now, and when this next one comes, the first one can't get, her, get any more than the second one or whatever, right? So to me, loving one more kid one more than the other, that's not cool. I, to me, it needs to be spread completely. So here's where the mentoring part is reflective. And now and then I'm going to end. People are putting the birds all over their bodies. I'm seeing the tattoos nonstop of the hollow birds. It's constant. Something's going on in this world where every time I show up at a clinic, somebody's just tattooed more birds on them. Something about what's going on here, people are making a mark on themselves permanently. Go figure. So you answer the question, and I'm gone. That you're asking the wrong guy. Don't ask the mentor about mentoring. That's not going to work. See ya. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Paul, for coming on. Are coming off. Bye. Bye, Paul. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out with me and Paul today. It was an amazing experience. And uh, as always, guys, uh, know your gear.